deep dive on health. And when I began to structure this talk, I started with a syntax. That's what everybody <coughs> wants to teach you. And I think it's easy to teach syntax. But it's mostly documented, and you guys know it. So I'm actually going to do an experiment. And I'm going to try to do something that I think is harder than teaching syntax, harder than teaching PowerShell. I'm going to try to teach you to write help content. And I hope that everybody leaves this session being having one extra tip, one extra step to being a better content writer. Did you put so, yes, I did. Thanks. Yeah. So this is me, and that's what I look like, and that's what I think I look like. <laughs> so I work for Sapien Technologies. I need to stand close. Um, and I blog, and I tweet, and I teach. <coughs> Have a good time. So it's all about the content today. So I have two goals today. I want to inspire you to write better help by talking about the costs of not writing help and the benefits of writing excellent help. And then I want to enable you to write better help by teaching you some of the tricks of the trade that professional writers use to make themselves more productive and to make the help that they write more helpful. So we're going to use the little get lorem ipsum commandlet in the PowerShell community extensions module. That's one of my absolute favorite modules. Um, when I looked, you can tell that this um, cute little commandlet has no help. That's auto-generated help. Um, so along with doing this session, we're going to contribute to the PSCX module. Anyone ever hear this excuse? I'm too busy. Adam Bertrand, one of my favorite guys, Adam here, he said, I just want to get on with it. Okay? But when you look at an undocumented tool, it should give you that same kind of engineering cringe that you feel when you see an undocumented man oh, sorry, an unautomated manual process. You know how you look at one of those and you go, oh my god, a couple lines of script, right? But an undocumented tool is just as inefficient as an unautomated process. Right? If I spend a couple of hours writing a script to automate a process, I've saved dozens of hours on the other side. I've um, reduced the number of errors, increased the consistency, and it's the same thing with help. If I have an undocumented tool, if I put an hour into writing good help content for a tool or even a day, then every person who uses my tool saves an hour in discovery time. Okay? And the more people who use my tool, the greater the value of that documentation is. Right? So if I spend a couple of hours writing fabulous help, and then 200 people pick up that tool and don't have to spend an hour, then the efficiency that I've gained is very similar to automating. Um, here, this one. I'm not good at writing. Your user is worse. They're uninformed, they're stressed, and they're busy. This is your responsibility. So here are just a few tips to start. If you need to write help, find a professional writer. If you can't, find a buddy, OK? Because help isn't about documenting the implementation of the tool. It's not about talking about your algorithm or the way you solve the problem. It's about describing the user interface from the perspective of a naive user. It is very hard to do that when you're the module author. Okay? If you're a module author, find a buddy. Okay? Write a first draft of the help and turn it over to them. Try to find someone who will be honest with you and ask you tough questions. And you know, I love interacting with the MVPs. Forget the MVPs, right? They don't really need that much help. Think of a naive user, somebody out in the field who's really busy, who's going to pick up your module. There are lots of benefits to you for writing help. One thing is that the process of explaining things makes you a better blogger, a better instructor. If you're, if you're um, writing magazine articles, just the practice, that 10,000 hours of explaining things, yeah. It also helps you find bugs. Oh, we'll get, we'll totally get to that one, yeah. 
Um, Kirk said that it helps you find bugs. I actually found one in little Get Lorem Ipsum. So, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Um, the other, th this is sort of um, taking help and turning it on its side. So, typically, you write your module, right? And then at the very end, just before you ship it out the door, it's like, oh my God, I probably need to add help to this. So I'm going to turn this process around. This was in my um, PS Blogging Week article last week, two weeks ago. Okay. Now here's the concept. This is PowerShell 5. It's not PowerShell 1. right? We're professional developers now. We have things in production in enterprise environments. We need to start acting like professional developers. Pat yourself on the back. You're not a beginner anymore. right? So you need to adopt some of the techniques that professional developers use. And professional developers write to a specification. Right? So what I'm suggesting is that, you write, is that you write yourself a specification. And this is what it looks like. A, design, a specification describes the design of your user interface. Okay? Now, I've heard people tell me, I write command line tools. They don't have a user interface. Wrong. They don't have a graphic user interface, but they absolutely have a user interface, and they have a user experience. And if you design your user experience in advance, then your product will be much better. So the way that you do this is that in the description, you describe the ideal user experience. You haven't written a line of code. Okay? Then the next thing I usually do is I do the return value in the outputs because I have a clear sense of what I want this thing to output, right? Then I write the examples, okay? I haven't written a line of code. So the, this is what I want it to look like when I'm done. The experience of writing the examples helps you figure out which parameters you need. It helps you decide on parameter names and parameter combinations, which gives you your parameter sets. You get an experience of what, what you need to pipe to this and get out of it, which helps with your inputs and outputs. And then when you're all done, when you stop and you code to your spec and you finish, you can reuse that spec as help. A little different way of thinking about it. You can also use the examples that you write, especially the ones with output, as tests. We've heard about Pester this week and um, systematic test frameworks. So you can take the help examples that you write and reuse them as tests. And I'm going to be working with Dave Wyatt to make that really easy. This is just a, you know, a, a syntax transformation. Take it right out of help and put it in Pester. So a couple of easy help writing rules. Okay? I had 20 of these. I got it down to, I wanted three, I got four. Okay? These should be pretty easy to remember. Use clear, simple language. This is not the place to show off the breadth of your vocabulary. Write novels. Okay? Get, not retrieve. Use, not utilize. Don't ever say utilize. That word has no meaning. Okay? Use. Change, not modify. And if you're writing a remove commandlet, right, because that's an approved verb, that word is really ambiguous in English. Be very careful. Let people know what it means. Okay, is this permanent? Am I deleting it? Am I just removing it from the session? Is this temporary? Okay, use the active voice. Okay, because the passive voice obscures the actor. And when you're giving instructions, that's deadly. Okay, the user needs to know what's their responsibility and what your tool does for it. Okay, and you can't be ambiguous about that. So instead of the objects can be exported, you can export the objects, or you must export the objects. Give instructions in the order that the user needs them. Okay, so close your eyes, just a second, and I'm gonna read a sentence, and you can feel your brain trying to rearrange the sentence. Ready? <coughs> Click Run in the Things section of the Home tab. Where do you start? Okay, so if we use this little principle, it's in the Home tab, in the Things section, click Run. Make sense? Everybody got that one? Okay. Task first, then instructions. 
Okay? And this is one of those things, right? You're involved in your parameters and you want to talk about what your parameters do. Use my format parameter to format the date. No, you're the user. The user is trying to um, accomplish a task. Okay? This is especially important for users of left to right languages who tend to scan down the left side of the page looking for information. Okay? So to format the date, use the format parameter. To avoid access denied errors, use the credential parameter. See how that, see the difference? Okay, so let's do our little case study. And um, this is PowerShell Help Writer. This is the newest tool for Sapien, and this is my dream environment for writing help. So I can get a, a blank help file if I need it to do that spec thing, or I can point it to a module. When I point it to a module, it scrapes the code, it grabs everything out of there that's useful for help, okay? and it puts it in this file. Then it goes and it grabs any help that you've done in any format, <coughs> comment-based help, XML-based help in any language, and it puts it all in this beautiful, validated, perfect PSMAML file for help. Okay? Um, it follows all the PowerShell naming standards. It puts everything in the right place. You don't have to think about that. If you want to look at your XML, you click the nice button. You can edit in here. You can validate your file. If you, you know, if you look at it, you can reformat the document if you need to. And you can seamlessly switch back to the designer. Um, and this is just 1.0. So. Hey, yeah. Is it, uh, is, this, is this thing smart enough to understand like uh, custom help for providers? No. No, it doesn't do provider help either. Yeah, custom commandlet help for providers. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Um, but again, this is. You said it's a mess? Oh, no, sorry, I thought you said it was a mess. Custom commandlet help for providers is tough to do. Yeah. Because it goes inside your provider help. Yeah. yeah. You said it was a mess, right? Yeah, I said it was a mess, yeah. Mess. Yeah, yeah. Um, not not 1.0, but that's on our list. Does it spell check? I'm sorry. The first question was about custom command help for providers. I'll have to learn how to do this. And the second one was spell check. There are a couple of things that I would love this to do. Yeah. Does it support about help topics? No, it does not. It doesn't support about topics. No, it does not. So, but again, it's 1.0. And I have a long list of things that I want this to do. It's better than mammal. Oh, it is mammal, but yeah, it's the studio. Working in the studio is much better than mammal. One of the things I really wanted to do is I want to be able to run my examples right from here. Right, so long list, but it's this is the tool that I dreamed of at Microsoft that I couldn't get. So got it now. So um, so this is Get Lauren Ibsen, and um, I'm gonna run through the process of creating help for this. Oh, did I go back to the wrong version? There we go. Okay, so when I write, I never start with a blank page. It's too hard. I start with a checklist, okay? And I'll share these checklists with you. When I write a help description, which is almost the, always the first thing that I write, okay, I use a checklist like this. Describe the UI, explain the intended use, call out important parameters, list requirements, warn people. No one should encounter some weird thing when they ran it, if, it's, if they haven't been warned in the help file. Mention version restrictions, if this is a rev, new features. And always do that inverted triangle thing, the most essential things first, because if your reader reads just the first line, you want to make sure that they got the most important information. So let's apply this to good old Get Lorem Ibsen. It, I can't say this, Get Lorem Ibsen, it's placeholder text, it returns a string, you can use it wherever strings go. And my warning is that this is fixed stuff. It isn't random. I don't want anyone to think that it is. Okay, So let's switch over there and see what we ended up with. The get Lauren Ibsen commandlet gets a placeholder or filler text, which is commonly used to demonstrate the graphic elements of a document or a visual presentation. It returns a string. 
You can include the string in files, pipe it to commandlets that take string values, and insert it in serialized files. Get Lorem returns fixed values to get random text, use get random. So I just followed my, my little checklist. Okay. Let's get back here. So I grabbed a couple of descriptions that could do some work. Okay. These are real live descriptions. Okay. The first one doesn't tell me anything. I have no idea what the context is. I don't know how to use this. Somebody was rushing. The second one is a good start, right? It determines whether a PowerShell script has syntax errors. That, that gives me a great deal of information. These don't have to be long, right? I could use a little more information. Um, you know, it, it's nice to know that it comes from the tokenizer, right? But um, get short path is, is almost there. Read archive is one of my favorite commandlets. This actually, we, we now have expand archive and compress archive in PowerShell 5. We don't have this, okay? You can, you can peek into an archive without unzipping it, all right? This is the current description. I don't need to pick on the author, right? We're trying to help, okay? Um, enumerates compressed archives such as 7z or rar, and because this isn't correctly capitalized, it looks like a typo, right? Emitting archive entry. Uh, read archive is useful if you wish to perform filtering. You, whoa. <laughs> cobwebs, right? I want arrows, not cobwebs. So I'm going to take my checklist and apply it to read archive. Okay? It gets files in a compressed or archive file without unzipping it. It returns archive entry objects. It works on zip, 7z, or rar. It took me two minutes to look that up and make sure that it was right. It's worth the two minutes, right? You can select contents out of it, and you can pipe to string format, and here's the outcome. I've used my two to do this, this, to do this, this, right? At this point, this isn't my module, it's not my tool, it's not my area of expertise. I send it for a tech review, okay? And then the, my buddy um, comes back to me and says, oh, you know, you got this wrong, or there's a subtle thing, or it would be great to tell people about this. Okay. Is this helping? Cool. Okay. The examples, what, if help is show and tell, the examples are the show. It's the most, absolutely most important part of your help. That's why we have get help dash examples. Okay, couple of best practices. Every example should be a model or template for a real command. Teach one concept in each example. Everybody likes to show error handling. That doesn't go in an example. It will obfuscate your, your focus, okay? Show expected output so the user knows if they're doing it right, if what they get is what's expected. Use each parameter at least once with a realistic parameter value. And that shows people how to format parameter values. That's always one of the most ambiguous things is what, what's the value? In what format do I put this value? Use full parameter names, no commandlet aliases. Use resources that the users have on their system so that if they try the commands, they work. Okay? Avoid extended one-liners, <coughs> one operation per step, so that people understand the strategy of the command. And um, again, don't be clever. Not the right place. So here's our example checklist. The first one should use only mandatory parameters. Okay? The second example, or more, depending on how many parameters you have, should throw in those optional ones in different parameter combinations. And by the end, you should be showing real world examples of how you intend this tool to be used. Okay. I'm going to switch over. Okay. Look at my examples. Okay. So this one is just mandatory parameters. There aren't any. I'm just using the command with, with no parameters at all and explaining what it gets. I've thrown in a couple of the optional parameters. And this little guy, let me scroll down, I have it in super large mode, shows using it in XML, right? I just have a little here string and I've added it to the XML. 
And this shows that I can pipe it to outfile. Okay? Fool around with it, use replace, and pipe it to outfile. <coughs> so parameters. Parameter descriptions. They're real simple because you can see that three of these things are optional, but the important parts are the effect of using the parameter on the behavior of the commandlet and the content or format of parameter values. If it's an optional parameter, you want to mention the default values or the default behavior. You, um, if necessary, tell how to get the parameter values and then talk about the interaction with other parameters. Okay? The other thing to remember is that get command cannot get globbing information, and it, right now it does not return the default value, even though it could get that from code because it knows it. Okay? So when you're writing help, you need to write the description, and you need to enter those parameter values, because no tool that you use right now can get those for you. Couple of hints. If there's already a good parameter description for this parameter, reuse it. No need to write from scratch. I didn't write this one. This is the credential parameter description from Get Windows feature. It's excellent. You might need to change it in order to make it accurate for your tool. Reuse good parameter descriptions. Um, I've got a little script. Um, mine's called Get Parameter Description. I'm sure everybody has one of these. You go to Get Command with parameter name and pipe it to Get Help. I don't need to tell you that. Okay. Reuse help for commandlets that are included in your function. Sometimes your function is sort of a wrapper around a nugget command, one or two of them, and you're just getting, you're collecting parameter information just to pass it through. Reuse the original parameter description. No need to change it. Okay? And the, the little example that I have here is in um, Don Jones's toolmaking book, if you haven't looked at it, awesome. Learn tool making in a month of lunches. He has a get system info command, right? That calls get sim instance with its computer name parameter. Reuse the computer name parameter description. It's already written. Okay, and use parameter description checklists. So for commonly used parameters, we have some checklists already developed. Okay? For the name parameter. People don't know what to say. The name is the name, the server name, computer name. Can I pick any name? Must it exist already? Are there any naming requirements or best practices? And must the name be unique in a certain scope? Okay, and this is the way it's used. Okay. Enter a name, you can choose any name, but it's best to associate it with a computer name. It needs to be unique in the subscription. Anyone's used Azure? The path parameter, can I use a directory or a file or both? If it's a file, which type or extension do I need? Do I need to specify the extension or just the base name? Must it exist already? If it exists, are you going to overwrite it? Can I use wildcards? And here I've used it for a directory. Okay, specifies a path to the directory if it doesn't exist. And here I've used it for a file. Is, is this easier than just starting out from scratch? Yeah. Okay. Here's one for the computer name. I'll put these all in a place where you can reach them. Okay. And let's go look at the ones that I did for Get Laura Mibson. This is really simple. It has a length parameter that takes an int. So it specifies the number of items. The default is one. And then it works with the switch parameters for the commandlet. And I explain how. So with word, length determines the number of words. Okay. So paragraph, character, and word are almost the same. These are switch parameters that specify the unit for the length parameter. Um, and I mentioned for paragraph that because paragraph is the default, it's used whenever a character or word aren't specified. And then we have this cool language thing that selects the language, and I list the valid values with a little example of each, because they're cool. And it didn't take up much space. 
Really simple. Do you see how much time I've saved the user? If this were a complex commandlet, that took a lot to learn. Okay, I've just done the basic research. It, this took me no time at all. Inputs and outputs. So inputs are the things that I can pipe to the commandlet. Usually, I, I typically list only the ones by value unless, unless they're none by value and the ones for property name work, right? There's some that, some parameters that take um, values by property name but the property names don't match up. Not a very good experience. So there are two parts of the input, the inputs, the type, meaning the full name of the .NET type, and a description where you name the parameter to which that, that value type is actually bound by the parameter binder. So for instance, for invoke command, we have a script block type. And I wrote, you can pipe a command in a script block to invoke command and use the dollar input automatic variable to represent objects in the command. The outputs are my return types, a really important thing to tell people, especially when it's conditional, okay? So in this case, add computer returns a computer change info object but only when you use the pass-through parameter. Otherwise, it doesn't return anything at all. And I actually found a bug, right? And now, I found a lot of bugs when I was working with a PowerShell team. Um, I once got an award for finding as many bugs as anybody on the test team, okay? Now that's not, well, it might be partly because I'm good at breaking things. But it's also because when you write examples and you play around with a command, right, you're usually the first person other than the developer to touch the thing. And it's much better to find and fix bugs at this stage, right, than to fix them later. And I just found a doc bug. Um, the output type attribute on the commandlet is just a note property, right, so it can be wrong. And so it says that I can, um, that it will sometimes return an array of strings and sometimes a scalar value. And I couldn't find any conditions under which it would return an array. So I'll discuss that with the author. I might have just missed a condition. I write the synopsis last, okay? It's a summary, and I can't summarize something I haven't written. So even though it's at the top, right, write it last, okay? The synopsis is the go, no go for the user. Okay? It should tell the user at a glance whether this is the right tool for the job or they should keep looking for something else. Okay? So here's the checklist. Identify the technology, describe the action and the outcome, and say if it's generic. So Lauren Ibsen was really easy. The technology, so to speak, is Lauren <coughs> Ibsen. It gets placeholder text, it returns a string, so the result, my synopsis is, gets a string of placeholder text, Lauren Ibsen, okay? Let's take a look at these. Gets the current configuration. Does this apply to my technology? Will it solve my problem? Okay, now I have to invest my time to figure out what's going on. Walks the specified upgrade domain, okay? This is an idiom. Sometimes it's technical language. I'm totally fine with technical language. This is an idiom. Not all of our users are native English speakers. Be careful of idioms. Now this next one is really long, so I'll probably like that, right? No, okay? Sends information to the next resource. Next is contextual. Or fails if there's no, hmm. Okay, and then there's Azure, where they repeat the commandlet name. <clears throat> it's on GitHub, you can help. Okay. So let's fix these. So instead of gets the current configuration, gets the current configuration of the desired state configuration resource node. Better? Couple extra words, it's, it's not a big deal. Gets the properties of a Windows domain upgraded by using this whatever command. By walks the domain, they just meant get the prop returns property values, okay? Sends, sends a configuration object to the next, to the child resource in the, and I just use a fictitious one, in a resource tree, okay? And the last thing is about help. 
So we learned this week that when you submit something to the PowerShell gallery, it better have a manifest file. If I were the king of the world, it would need an about topic too. Okay? Every module that has more than one command in it, or more than two, needs an about topic because the about topic explains how to use the, mod the commands in your module together to solve a problem. Okay? So, describe the technology. Explain in what order I'm supposed to use the commandlets. This is, this is the group policy module. Does anyone not use it? Okay? Fabulous, incredibly useful thing. If I open this up, I, even if I know a lot about group policy, where do I start? What's a prerequisite? Okay? What do I have to make sure to do as a best practice? What are the limitations of this module? Okay? So, describe the technology, the order of use, the prerequisites. Is one designed to pipe to another? How do I use this module to solve a problem? And then fill it with examples. Okay? Invoke command had 16 examples, and people laughed. Anybody ever find that there were too many examples somewhere? Yeah, fill it with examples. You know how to use this. You wrote it. Okay. Here's a template for your about topic. This gives you the headers that people look for. It's very difficult to, um, to search things in an about topic, right? So break it up. So typically, the topic thing goes at the top with the name of your about topic, short description, long description. I distinguish troubleshooting notes from notes, right? Um, lots of examples, keywords. Um, I throw things in there. So starting with PowerShell 3, get help and some phrase tries to match it with the name of a help topic. If it can't find a help topic, it looks in, a, in the whole help topic name. So if it's not an exact match, it looks as a partial match. And if it can't find that, it does a full text search of the help file. So I'm using that full text search feature here. If there's a synonym for the name or primary purpose of my commandlet, I put them in keywords, okay? And you know, get help is going to do that, that full text search, it's gonna find it. And then see also our links, okay? We're just starting to write classes in PowerShell 5. We don't have a help format for classes. So what I'm suggesting here is that you create an about topic, one for each class that you define. And I use the um, headings that they use in MSDN. Okay. Um, I hear rumors that there might even be um, some a special XML formatting for help in classes. And if there is, use that instead. Okay. This is really important. When you write help for a parameter and get command can't find the parameter, get help won't display it, even if it's really a good description. Okay? And they did this on purpose. Okay? If I'm working in PowerShell 3 and I run update help, it's going to download the, the latest help, which was written for PowerShell 5. Okay? There might be commands on my system that were added in 4 and 5 that I don't have. So, they, you know, get help is smart. It checks with get command, and it only displays the parameters for things that get command can find. However, think this messes up things like dynamic parameters that are created at runtime rather at the time that the module is exported and help is cached. Okay? So if you have a dynamic parameter, explain it in the description section, okay? And say that it's a dynamic parameter. So if somebody's doing an XML scan of your module and trying to get the parameters out of it, they're not gonna find this, but at least it's documented. Otherwise, they won't see anything at all. We'll call to action and then, I do have time for questions, okay? Write help. Write a tool specification and help format and reuse it. Find a buddy. Don't do this yourself. Use checklists as prompt and write an about topic for each module. This is how to find me. And this is how to let me know how I can improve. So I'll take questions. Yeah. Any advice for writing uh, help topics in different languages? 
don't use Google Translate. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got to learn how to do this because uh, that's a good question. So um, I won't repeat questions that aren't so good. Right? So the question was, how do you write topics in other languages? So this is um, internationalization, localization, and multi-language support. So you know syntactically what you need to do. So you need to have a directory with a language code and put the files in there. But you mean content-wise. So what I would do is I would grab a native speaker of that language, hopefully someone who knows a little PowerShell, Right? And it might be easier to teach PowerShell to someone who knows the language rather than trying to teach a foreign language to someone who knows PowerShell. Right? Um, but they'll be able to do things like translate idioms if we have them and make sure that the terminology names are correctly translated. Other than that, um, I think that you can use the same format that you use. It's a really important thing to do, especially um, you know, in, in general, there are places in the world where lots of people speak English, especially people who do IT, right? But there are places, uh, Japan is one, I know, I think China might be another, where very few people speak English comfortably enough. And to make our modules as useful as we can be, especially as some of the responsibility for, you know, PowerShell development devolves to the community and we're, you know, things are in open source. Right? It's even more important for us not to, be, not to just say someone else will translate this. The other thing to do is just as you're trying to attract um, professional writers to contribute to your projects, look for people who are interested in doing a little volunteer work um, and invite them to come and help. Yeah, great question. Anything else? Good. Yeah, Lee. Do you have any suggestions for people wanting to become better writers? Oh, yeah. So the question was, do I have suggestions for people who want to become better writers? Um, practice, okay? This is a great way to practice explaining things. Pass it back and forth. So if Lee writes a commandlet, he sends it to me, and I write a first draft of the documentation, and I send it back. You, have you ever seen anything like this? Yeah. Then I nag. No, we're not going to talk about that. Okay? And then he sends it back to me with corrections and I rewrite it. Sometimes the correction is a conceptual error, so I have to rewrite the whole thing. But that's just fine, because the most important thing is to get it right for the customer. Okay? I'll even send it back. If there are lots of revisions, I'll send it back again. Okay? I just did this with, with Adam. Um, I don't think it was that painful um, on either side. So yeah, again, practice. You know, revisions, going back and forth, and again, there are different kinds of writing. So if you want to write a novel, you take an entirely different approach. But for technical writing, you want to be as clear and simple, you know, clear, simple language. And then, if you can, step back from the time that you knew this technology and describe it to someone who is a naive user. It is really hard to start from scratch. Right? Remember what it was like. You know, when I first started reading that first little monad book, remember that one? Okay? The guy did this cool example where he showed that you, you type the you type a command, like you put it in parentheses, you type a command, you type a dot, and you can do a property. But he used a property that wasn't in the default display. I had no idea where that thing came from. Right? So before I show people how to use properties of any object, if I'm creating a custom object, right? before I show them how to get properties of it, I do a format list dash property all. Okay? So just look kind of tricks of the train. More questions? No, no, they're text files. I wish they were a mammal. You know, mammal's kind of a pain in the patootie, but text files are worse because, you know, you, you, you can't go, if you go looking for them, you have to do a full text search, right? So they're just text files right now. Which is why you can't do get help about something dash online. Right? Does that answer your question? So do you guys know that Adam has volunteered his module 
I'm going to, um, for the PowerShell Summit in Europe, I'm going to write help for his module, and that's going to be our lab exercise. So anyone who's coming to the PowerShell Summit in Europe. Well, yeah? Uh, you, you mentioned with examples, providing what the example output would look I don't think I see that very often where people actually do that. Um, I, mean, I don't know if you showed a uh, screen, screen grab, like what that looks like um, to, to include that sample output. Yeah, so the question was about including sample output. So there are times when it's a really great idea. And that's when the sample output on almost every system looks kind of similar, right? Or there are similar resources on every system so that the sample output looks really useful, right? But in general, um, including sample output is a great thing because it lets users check their assumptions, okay? Now, so in PowerShell, when you're writing in XML, the output needs to go in the same dev code block as the as the command, because if you put it in the, in the XML element where it's supposed to go, it's not formatted right, okay? So PowerShell Help Writer takes care of that because we knew about it in advance. Um, Michael Simmons asked me today a question that's very similar to that, and that's that if you have a multi-step command and you're doing it in comment-based help, Right? Get help assumes that the very first line is your command and everything else is our remarks. And I can't figure out a way to fix that. Okay? So use XML help um, and put it all in that dev code element. Just line after line and then put your remarks in the remarks element. Should we file a connect on that? I would, yeah. Leave that to it. So I gave the PowerShell team, I think, God, an hour and a half list of wish list of things that I'd like to see just made a lot easier for you. If they're going to ask the community to write help, right, then it should be easy to do. More questions? Cool. Well, thank you for coming.